I'm not sure if this was a, a trendy thing for anyone else in the early to mid 2000s, but when I was a child during this time, it appeared that many characters and books and films and TV shows had pen pals, distant figures with whom they were best friends and to whom they scribed whatever was going on in their lives. One of these TV shows, Grange Hill, actually featured an episode where a girl met up with a pen pal, who turned out not to be a French boy her age, but uh, a creepy middle-aged man who shoved her in the back of his van. Apparently, I, I didn't let that sway me from seeking out a pen pal of my own. Anyway, I, I searched pen pals on Google and clicked on the first few sites. The one that I settled on already had a list of children's names, ages, locations, small bios, and an email address too. I scourged the page, but couldn't find anyone my age. The youngest girl was Lottie, age 12, from Amsterdam. So, I clicked on her email address, and tapped out a cheerful message telling her that I was from the UK and that I was only 8, but I was really mature for my age and please be my online friend. I remember she responded pretty quickly, and I remember that she told me that it didn't matter that I was only 8. She liked younger girls better anyway. Retrospectively, that was creepy as hell to say, but... I was eight and naive. So, we struck up a friendship and we would email back and forth. I told her everything about my annoying friends at school, my parents fighting, my love for Jacqueline Wilson books and Doctor Who. Like the idiot that I was, I told her the country I lived in too and the town. I didn't give her my address, but I was stupid enough to send her a picture of myself. She didn't send anything back and... I didn't think to ask because, once again, I was uh, an idiot. She told me that I was really pretty. Things are a little bit fuzzy to remember, but one thing I do remember is that she said that she liked my eyes. A few weeks of this goes on, and my older sister was the only person who knew, and she told me one day that she wasn't comfortable with this. Because she's only older by a year, though, I, I thought I knew better and brushed her off. But... She asked me to tell our mum, and I didn't want to, but I had a feeling in my gut that I should. And so, that evening, I, I told her. Putting on my most persuasive voice, I tried to convince her that Lottie was really cool and nice. But my mum is protective, and she knew straight away that something was wrong. She asked to see the emails and told me, and Lottie isn't a girl. She's a man preying on me. Mum pointed at the typing style and the email address. She doesn't even talk like a little girl, she said. You see, Lottie's email address wasn't simply like at hotmail.com or at gmail.com or something like that. It was at something that, according to Mum, looked like a business name, not something that a little girl would have an email with. Her writing style had also changed over the weeks that we'd been talking. It had gone from normal to typing in slightly caps and slightly lowercase, and this didn't give my mum a good feeling. She told me to stop emailing Lottie, and I lied and I said that I would, but naturally I, I carried on. I must admit though that I was a little bit unnerved now. I emailed Lottie a few days later saying that my mum wanted her mum's email address. She started questioning me why when she replied, but eventually gave it. <laughs> I was relieved, and in hindsight, I, I should have wondered why she didn't want to give me the email address straight away anyway. And maybe I realized this a little subconsciously too, because I actually asked her for a photo of her and another with her mum. Again, she questioned why and asked if something was wrong, and I just told her that my mum wanted to know what she looked like. There was no reply for a few days, but... Then finally, I, I get an email of her. Attached were two pictures, one of her and one of her with her mum. But they just didn't look right. They didn't look like a, a normal photograph, if you know what I mean. They looked really polished and professional. And I think by this point, the unsettling feeling was just too much for me to handle. I'm not good at shutting things down with someone and... Even to this day, I, I can't calmly and slowly end a relationship or friendship, so I replied to the email with the pictures and just wrote that I never wanted to speak to her again. Lottie didn't take it very well. Not well at all, actually. She told me that she hated me and that I was ugly and she said a few other nasty things, but 
But what freaked me out was when she told me that she would make me as miserable as I made her. You can guarantee that if I wasn't scared before, I was shitting myself then. I cried and told my mum who was pissed about me lying but worried as well, so I guess when she banned me from using the internet for a few weeks it was actually a protective measure as well as a punishment. But nothing did happen in the end and this made me think that maybe I'd freaked out on Lottie for no reason. Maybe she hadn't lied. It was only a year and a bit later when I finally stumbled upon a new show and found out that those pictures, they weren't Lottie after all. Does anyone else remember an Australian show called Mortified? Well, the photos that she had sent were actually headshots of the lead actress, Marnie Kennedy. So Lottie, I don't know who you are or what your intentions were, but I'm glad that my mum stopped me from seeing you. So this happened a few weeks ago. I recently graduated from college with a degree in biology, but decided to take a minute for myself before applying to medical school. My school was in a, a dangerous area, and I still rent in the area because my roommate is a master's student at the same university. But we live about five blocks off campus on a street where you would not want to be caught alone at night. So one day, I was by myself in our apartment just jamming to some tunes, and I heard a banging on the door. This was odd to me because my apartment is a row home style apartment with two other apartments below me and a front door, which I had most certainly locked behind me when I entered the building about 10 minutes prior. It was also concerning because I'm a 5 foot tall woman and currently alone. Since we live on the top floor, nobody but my roommate and I are ever up on the third floor and I had not recently submitted a maintenance request or anything. I turned the music off and I sat still for a moment waiting to see if it happened again. And the banging started once more. Now, I recognized that this was pretty stupid, but I walked to the front door and opened at the tiniest crack to see a, a really large, dirty, heavyset man with a beard on the other side. I asked, can I help you? And he looked at me in the eye and said, I'm here to fix the air conditioning leak. You need to let me inside the unit so that I can make the repairs. My management company only has one regular maintenance worker who I was familiar with and I'd never seen this man standing at my door previously. He took a step forward while I quickly said wrong place and slammed and locked the door. Initially I wasn't too concerned because maybe he was just in the wrong place, right? But I emailed my landlord to ask about maintenance reps in the area to which she replied, the company had an HVAC technician out today but none to your address. What did he look like? After describing him as a, a large, heavier white man with a full beard, she responded, That was not our HVAC rep. He's a small, thin man. I'm not sure who was out there. And now I'm, I'm worried about my safety because clearly someone has keys to our building and even my management company can't account for who he may have been. They will also not change the front door lock, so... I'm kind of on my own with this one. I'm all ears if you guys have any ideas on how to keep myself safe. I used to live in a very small town that was predominantly safe for kids. I only had some drug issues really and my house was located in a small and upscale part of the town which mainly housed families. There was a small pond with lots of green in the neighborhood that was about a five minute walk from my house I'd say. To get to the pond you had to go down a grass hill. The neighborhood kids including myself would always go down to the pond for hours to catch frogs and skip rocks and all that good stuff. So on this particular day it was raining and pretty cold so there were no other kids at the pond. My best friend, her brother, who was one year older than us and myself decided to head down to the pond for a bit. After about half an hour, we see at the top of the hill a, a minivan pull up. We didn't think anything of it because there was a neighborhood mailbox at the top of this hill as well as a lot of people stopped there to get their mail. A man started to get out of the minivan and I remember him being older, probably in his 60s. And another note too is since we lived in a small town, everyone kind of knew everyone or at least could recognize everyone and... I remember thinking that it was strange that I'd never seen this man before in town or in the neighborhood. 
he got out and just stared at the three of us for what seemed a pretty long time. All of a sudden, he yelled at us and said, It's not safe down there. You kids better come up here. But my best friend and her brother looked terrified and I had this gut feeling that something just wasn't right. We didn't say anything back and he continued to repeat the phrase, It's not safe down there. You kids better come up here. Now, there was nothing unsafe about what we were doing or where we were standing or anything, so the whole request was really strange, but it started to become more like uh, an order than a request. And our fight or flight reaction kicked in, and we all booked it up the other side of the hill, which was only about a few meters away from him in the minivan. As soon as he saw us running, he got into his minivan too and started driving slowly behind us. He was literally following us too until he reached my house. Luckily, my garage door was open and my parents' two cars were parked inside. We hid behind one of the parents' cars and watched as he pulled to the side of my house and parked. My parents were inside, but obviously had no idea what was happening. He stayed parked in front of my house for a couple of minutes until my dad came outside to take out the trash and saw the three of us hiding. I guess the man saw my dad and drove away, but as soon as he left, we told my parents everything. Even until this day, 12 years later, my parents still think that we were just being overdramatic and that it was a man that was just genuinely concerned for our safety, but because of the weather. Nonetheless, we weren't allowed to go back to the pond anymore, and I don't blame them for thinking this, though, because the three of us tended to work things up a bit and be a bit dramatic. But on this instance, I knew from the way that I had that strange feeling when I first saw him at the top of the hill that something was just off. And to this day, I, I still believe that he was planning something. So I just moved into this house uh, about a month ago now, and it's new. And there have already been about five different attempted break-ins now. The first night in the new house, I was upstairs with my wife, and I went downstairs to grab something and saw a light move across the room. I didn't think too much of it and wrote it off as a reflection from someone's headlight shining through the window or something, but the next night it happened again. My wife and I were upstairs again and both saw a light shining up the staircase. The only possible way that this could happen is if someone was either in our house or backyard as we have a six foot privacy fence and given the location of our staircase inside the house, it was impossible. I grabbed my gun and told my wife to lock herself in the bedroom and I'd call her when it was safe. All the doors were locked still, so no one was inside. However, the side gate was open. I called the cops, but since we live outside the city limits, we're under jurisdiction of the county sheriff, which means that their response time is about 30 to 60 minutes. After they arrived, they took my statement, and my wife and I went to get a lock for the side gate. About three days later, I leave to grab some snacks for a movie night with the missus and she calls me about five minutes later asking if I'm downstairs and accidentally locked myself out. And I wasn't. I drove back home as fast as I could but by the time that I got there, no one was there. This pattern has happened four more times now too. I leave and five or ten minutes later, my wife calls asking if I'm outside so whoever this person or people are, they're definitely watching our house. Oddly enough, these events never happen when I'm at work though, only when I'm home for the night and then leave again. The most recent incident was the night of Thanksgiving though, and my friend and I left to go grab some alcohol for the after dinner party and my wife calls saying our three month old puppy is going berserk, barking at the front door and growling and she can hear people talking outside and someone actively trying to pick the lock. She said that she tried to call 911 but was put on hold. So my friend calls as we're driving home and we pull up about two minutes later and no one's there. But I do hear a car start down the road and tires squeal driving away. And there are some pretty gnarly tool marks all over our deadbolt. Like they tried to use a knife to get in or something. The cops came 45 minutes later, took a statement and left and... And nothing against the police in the area, but their response time is really a bit disheartening. I have since installed cameras by the front door and side gate and have a security system being installed on Wednesday. 
the police say it's just people looking for empty houses to loot appliances from because we're in a new development and all, and I don't buy it though. None of my neighbours have reported anything happening to them, and our house is very clearly lived in. And a scary thought has crossed my mind that maybe they're not targeting to steal things. Maybe they're targeting us as people. To be quite honest, I, I feel like a prisoner in my own house, and I just don't know what to do. Do you guys have any ideas? So, um, I don't even know where to start, to be honest, but my house, which I rent, has a ground floor and two floors, so three in total. I was getting ready to go out, and I went to the first floor in my room to get my makeup, and went to the second floor in my flatmate's room to do my makeup there. I go back in my room around 45 minutes later, and I see three of my purses on the floor, and the shoulder handle, I'm not sure if that's the word has been cut on two of them and a bit on the third one. Both purses are cut the same way in two spots. I start getting a bit freaked out because no one is in the house except me and my flatmate and we've been together the whole time upstairs. In the living room which is on the ground floor we left the back window door open to where at the room as we had some people over the night before. The door in the living room leads to a, a tiny garden which is protected by a tall fence, which is more protected by another wired fence, and I doubt anyone would be able to just climb on it and come in, cut purses, mind you, and take no money or cards from them and then just leave. The complex has eight flats, so all the tiny gardens are connected in a long line, but we are only connected to one as we're the last flat in the line. So... Absolutely nothing was stolen or even moved and we see no marks anywhere but it's still weird so we called the police to find an explanation. The police come and check the evidence. There's also a wet spot on the carpet in the room about 5 centimeters long and how the purses are cut. We ended up concluding that it must have just been a fox that went into the house, went upstairs, ate the bags and left based on the fact that a, a fox tried to enter the living room one time the same way a few weeks back. But the police said that it was not an animal cut. It's most probably a knife cut and asks if we've had any problems with anyone like an ex or something. We haven't and most people don't even know where we live. And no one really knows how to get to my room as the house is pretty complicated. The stairs in the house are metal and spiraled and you basically hear it from every spot in the house too if someone is on the stairs. Police call forensics to ask for evidence and whatnot and forensics say that they don't know what they can do as they can't take any fingerprints off the bags because of the texture and the wet spot is apparently dry by now. Police said that they've never heard of something like this before and that it makes no sense so it must be a ghost or something. <sighs> Who says that right? Anyway, they marked it off as a burglary and then they just left. I should mention though that the night of the morning before, we had the music pretty loud and our neighbor texted us pretty angrily to stop the noise. I mean, he does know the house as we have the same structure and he was the only one with the easy access, but he's like 75 years old and all the encounters we've had so far, he's been really nice. So... We've been left with something or someone coming in our house through the back garden that's protected by very high walls and wired fencing, entering the living room, passing by the PS4, the TV, expensive speakers, goes into the hallway, passes by very expensive shoes, goes up the stairs, enters the bedroom, cuts the handles to my purses, does not take absolutely anything, makes no noise, and then just leaves. Obviously, I, I slept in my flatmate's room last night after everything, and today I, uh, I went into the bedroom to clean it, and I actually found one of the missing handle pieces in my bed, under the blanket. I don't know what's going on, but nobody has any explanation, and this whole situation is just really creepy and weird. Also, today, after one day that I wrote this, I was putting my shoes on, and I picked up something from the shoe chair and another piece of black crocodile print leather just fell out from underneath. This is at the hallway shoe section on the ground floor. I thought that it was a, 
another part of the black bag, but I realized it was a part of my flatmate's black leather boots. So that means that this person or animal also cut one piece of one boot. It's not her. Those are definitely her favorite boots. And then they just hit it where they did. So, so far, they've cut a black crocodile print purse and a snake print purse. But today, we, we found a black piece of crocodile boot. Same material, different parts of the house. And we also got a bottle of wine from our neighbor to apologize for the noise and... I saw him today by accident. He thanked us for the wine and seemed generally nice and as if he got over it. We did this so that we can start talking again and ask if anything weird like this has happened and explain what happened to us. And he said exactly this. Nothing happened. Thanks for the heads up. I don't know what's going on but I'm feeling really on edge. Either there is a ghost in our house and something paranormal is going on or there's someone sneaking into our house somehow and they're doing some really weird shit. I'm sure many people know now that a shooting took place at Stoneman Douglas High School on Valentine's Day this year. I was a junior at the time and I've been at Douglas since the beginning of freshman year. Now it's my senior year and seniorities is really kicking my butt, but anyway, here's the story. So it was Valentine's Day, like I said, where I could see some people holding Valentine carnations and teddy bears while walking between classes and whatnot. I really didn't care much about the whole event, but secretly I, I did kind of hope to get something from some friends of mine. But we had a mandatory fire drill in the morning, important to know like the school board requires us sometimes to do. Time passed and it was on to the third period which was my study hall class or personalization as the school says. There I would do some homework and surf the web on my phone. I suddenly had the urge to go into the bathroom near the end of the class. Sometimes I go into pee in third period and sometimes in fourth. But keep this in mind too. So then I walked to my fourth period class which is in the 1300 building or the science building as we call it. You can see in pictures that it's about uh, 10 to 15 meters away from where the 1200 building aka freshman building was. A very very short walking distance in other words. I go in my physics classroom where we finished a virtual lab experiment and it was near the end of class and I looked at the clock pondering if I should go to the bathroom again because I drank a lot of water today. It's kind of a hassle to go to the bathroom in this class actually because every time I go pee in the 1300 building the bathroom is always locked so I walk over to the freshman building to do my business instead. And even sometimes the first floor bathroom is locked because of drug usage. Douglas is literally called a pot school by others. So I climb up the stairs to go to the second floor. But just this time I decided not to go because well school was almost out anyway. The fire alarm rings, red flag number one, which I thought was super weird because we already had a fire drill in the morning. It was probably culinary class again, so I didn't pay much attention and walked out the door to my designated area with my classmates like fire procedures had us do. I left my backpack behind and just took my phone with me and then I heard the sounds. I stopped walking three steps away from the door and looked in the direction of the freshman building fireworks is this some sort of simulation who would set up fireworks at this time suddenly i i had a very bad feeling wash over me and uh, my heart started to race and in the back of my mind i i thought that maybe that they could be gunshots yet i was still in denial because parkland is a really safe community i mean this is a place where upper middle class people reside and where crime rates are really really low I was just standing in the doorway wanting some sort of confirmation that yes this was happening when I heard it again. My mind went absolutely blank at this point. It was like someone took control of my body and flipped my fight or flight switch on. I turned away from the direction of the freshman building, went back in the classroom and bolted toward the fire escape door out in the back. I had a couple of students follow me too but they turned back at the last second to stay in class. I didn't really care though. I. I just wanted out at this point. 
But once out the door, I encountered a class who was out in their area and also thought that it was just a fire drill. And suddenly, it just occurred to me that I just ran out of the classroom when I wasn't supposed to. That was seriously my first thought when I was outside. I started to walk back in the direction to my class to follow the procedure because, yes, my dumbass thought nothing serious was happening. And more gunshots ran out in the air, which I still thought were fireworks, but I decided to stay in place with the group. Usually during fire drills, administrators would drive around in their golf carts to check out on teachers and students and whatnot. I saw one a couple of meters from me and I was about to walk up to him to say that I was lost when he just suddenly drove away super fast. Multiple police cars came around the corner with their lights flashing and a, a helicopter flew above me too and that's when I knew that things were really serious. I could still hear gunshots really close too so I ran somewhere to the edge of the school that had fences and was near the football or baseball field. I didn't know what path I specifically went. All I knew is that I was yeeting out of there quickly I tried climbing up the fences like other people were doing to escape, but I'm not athletic enough and I just slipped down like a loser. Suddenly, a, a chubby freshman limped up to where I am and a small group of people saying, help me, I've been shot. He cried out with tears running down his face and I looked at his leg and there was a gaping red bullet hole in his ankle and splatters of blood just everywhere around it. And maybe even a peak of white that was his bone, I think. My eyes were wide open at this point, mouth practically hanging open. Someone next to me said that it looks fake and he was still crying for help but we were just frozen solid. Suddenly an adult male came out of nowhere and directed us to go run and hide where a middle school nearby was. No one was doing anything to save the poor boy so I marched up to the guy and yelled out at him, a person is shot. He legit did not hear me though so I practically spit in his face again that the boy was shot. Finally, he said, what and where? Still hearing the gunshots that were directly behind me, I pointed at the boy and then proceeded to sprint across the football field with my heart pounding out of my chest. Halfway across the field, I called my mum in hysterics, saying that there was a shooting. She didn't understand what was going on and was confused because school wasn't out yet, and finally she understood and started yelling that I should run away as fast as I can, obviously. From my dad's point of view, her voice was apparently so loud that the neighbor came over and asked what was happening. Eventually, I walked across to Walmart and to the Bank of America where they picked me up. I, uh, I think the aftermath was the hardest part. When I got home, I was really calm like nothing ever happened. And I only broke down crying when I was called by my older sister who was in another high school when she heard the news. In the afternoon and supper time, I was joking around and laughing like I normally was. Basically, I was just uh, in absolute denial. The day after, I was in my shared bathroom with my sister on Twitter while brushing my teeth, and I looked at the names of some of the victims and saw some faces that I knew, and I just had a massive breakdown. So many uh, what-ifs came to my mind. What if I went to the bathroom during fourth period like I would sometimes do at the end of the class? I legit probably would have been gunned down. But what if the shooter did manage to successfully break the windows and shoot from there? I would have been smack dab in his line of sight when I was outside the 1300 building just standing around. Two weeks later, I returned to the school to reclaim the nest, the principal called it. What I didn't know was that one of the victims was in my psychology class and I never knew that she existed till now. I kept looking at the empty desk that was once hers and every time I did I, I felt numb inside. My teacher would later put a flower pot on her desk every day in her absence. Then in my statistics class there was another victim which meant uh, another empty desk. My stats teacher asked with tears in his eyes for us to reshuffle our seating arrangement around because he didn't want to look at the empty desk any longer. Still to this day, I, I have nightmares of being involved in shootings and would be scared of loud noises, basically PTSD. But throughout the couple of months as information was coming in, I would learn that my sister used to go to school with the shooter. But she described him as lonely and weird. Additionally, my male friend got death threats from him and would send him pictures of guns threatening to shoot him. Yes, he did report him before, but administrations didn't do anything and also he later testified in court. 
Also, I, I think I do know the identity of the boy who got shot in the ankle, but I'm not 100% sure. Apparently, the guy that I screamed at was an off-duty police officer who helped wrap the boy up and the boy gave him a good description of the shooter that was a, a massive help. I'm not going to confront him though because I don't want to bring up bad memories anymore. Things still aren't back to normal in Douglas and it never will be until perhaps once the freshmen who were there that day graduate. There's always some sort of tension in the atmosphere as if something major was going to happen. Lately, uh, a lot of fire alarms have been going off and every time it does, everyone would just go silent. I sincerely hope that no one would have to go through what my school and I did, but I know shootings will keep happening because that's the American way, right? And finally, I, I hate seeing or hearing his name, but the person who did this was Nicholas Cruz.